All right, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another edition of the Stanford Health Policy Forum. My name is Keith Humphreys. I'm a professor of psychiatry here at the medical school, and I chair the advisory group for the forum, which brings top health policymakers and thought leaders to Stanford so they can engage with the university community and the broader community about health, health promotion, and health care. This is our first forum for this academic year. Our next forum will be November 27th, and will be on the topic, why do we get fat? And is there any way to stay thin other than living on a diet of yogurt and wicker furniture? <laughs> the guests will be Gary Taubes, who is a Stanford-educated science writer, a writer of multiple bestsellers about calories and obesity, and our own Christopher Gardner, professor of nutrition. That's going to be a very interesting event, November 27th. The precise details of the room and the time will be available where you can find everything else about the forum, which is our website. That's Health Policy Forum, all one word, healthpolicyforum.stanford.edu. If you go to the website, you will also notice an archive. Every event we've had is available for you to watch. And that is my cue to say we are filming this today. And therefore, if you've got a beeper, pager, cell phone, MRI machine, and the like, <laughs> please turn it off if you can. Or if you have to have it on, please turn it to a silent setting. We'll get a, a much better uh, uh, sound quality if you do that. Thank you. Just to thank the people who put this together, Paul Costello is the head of communications and media at our med school and our, our regular and outstanding interviewer, as he's uh, doing again today. The government relations staff do yeoman's work for all the details, and there are a lot of details. And thank you so much, Lucy Wicks and Ryan Adesnik. And thank you to the other members of the advisory committee, um, Mr. Bob Burke, Associate Dean Ann Arvin, and Professor Dan Kessler. You make it happen. Really, we really do appreciate it. The other person who deserves to be thanked is the man whose office funds the forum. And uh, you know, I wouldn't flatter him just because he's my boss. Although, <laughs> although I got to say, you look younger every year, Phil. It's incredible. <laughs> I, I don't know how you do it. Anyway, so uh, he's one of the world's leading pediatricians, and he is the dean of our med school. And he will introduce our distinguished guest. So please welcome Dr. Phil Pizzo. Well, thank you so much, Keith, and uh, thank you for all you do. Uh, clearly, we're going to need a larger room uh, for the November Forum on Obesity. It is after Thanksgiving, so that makes me even a little bit more alarmed. Um, but today, uh, without doubt, is one of the most important topics facing all of us, uh, indeed our nation and the world, and that's the future of what healthcare is going to look like. Uh, and I couldn't think uh, of a more exciting and important and interesting speaker than our guest today, Zeke Emanuel. Zeke has been a friend for a long time, um, and I've had the pleasure of knowing him in various uh, different settings and capacities. But today, um, he is the Vice Provost for Global Initiatives at the University of Pennsylvania, where he's also um, the chair of the Department of Bioethics and Health Policy. And of course, he was a special advisor to the director of OMB um, as part of the big debate uh, and run-up um, to the Affordable Care Act. And we're so pleased, Zeke, that you've made the trip to visit with us today. And I am sure uh, we're going to hear a point of view um, today. So I'll ask Zeke to come forward um, and also Paul Costello, as you've heard, our esteemed Director of Communications who's going to lead the discussion. Thank you, Zeke. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you, Phil. Paul. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. We really appreciate your being here. Well, let's start out right away. And I want to start out with some recent news. In his Meet the Press appearance on Sunday, uh, Governor Mitt Romney stated a change in his position on the Affordable Care Act. And prior to Sunday, he said he would gut the act on his first day in office. And now he says he would keep one of the most popular pieces of the reform plan, which is allowing people with pre-existing conditions to obtain health insurance. Can you parse this for us? I mean, is it possible on the one hand to eliminate the act and yet keep one of the most expensive provisions? And if you do that, how do you do that? Well, first of all, I'm not sure I know what his position is. And I don't think that's a, I really, I'm not, I don't think that's a partisan uh, statement. If you look at Mitt Romney's career as a whole, I mean, he championed health care reform in Massachusetts. And let's face it, it wouldn't have passed without him. Uh, and I think you know, the exigencies of, of politics have made him 
move against the act. Uh, I sort of doubt that his heart's in it. Um, in being against the act, I think he understands that it's really uh, uh, necessary to move the country forward in the healthcare sphere. Um, and I think you got out of him on Sunday something about what he really uh, wants, which is you know you have to have you have to get people who have pre-existing conditions coverage. Uh, it turns out that the only way you can actually get them coverage is a mandate. The mandate didn't come out of nowhere. We know uh, both from health policy and health economics theory as well as practice of uh, low these many years that if you don't have everyone in the system and you just have the sick buying in the system, the rates go up and people can't afford it. I mean, if you look at states, and there are a few states that have guaranteed issue, which means that anyone who applies has to get coverage, uh, what you end up seeing without a mandate is that insurance rates are through the roof uh, because only the sick end up buying insurance because people who are healthy can't afford the insurance and wouldn't pay that amount. Uh, and people who get insurance are generally poor risk. They are going to use health care. They're going to use a lot of health care. Um, if you want to have an affordable system and you want to get coverage for people who have pre-existing conditions, you have to have everyone in. And if you're going to have everyone in, either you have to give it to everyone so it's free so they don't have to pay for it, or you have to have a mandate. It, it, I mean, as uh, President Clinton said, this is just simple arithmetic. And that's all it is. Um, and I, he understood it when he was governor of Massachusetts. And every single health policy person, no matter whether you're of the left or the right, and this isn't a partisan thing, understands it. It's just that we're in a sort of crazy political moment where you can say you know, things that on the face don't make sense, which is, well, cover pre-existing conditions, but we won't have a mandate. That's just not possible. Earlier today, you, had, you said that you're an optimist, and you believe that by 2020, we will have a very robust, perhaps, healthcare system, and the getting there is going to be the bumps of the road. So let's talk about the bumps of the road. What are the significant bumps or the hurdles that you think that a president, no matter who that president is, they're going to have to take the American people with them over that next period of time, eight years. So I can see from this audience, uh, many of you have had adolescent children. Some of you look like you were recently adolescent children. And everyone who's gone through that knows that it's a very bumpy road, but by the time you get into the 20s, things tend to smooth out. That is exactly where we are in healthcare, which is we're about to go through the teens and we'll get to the 20s and then things will smooth out. Uh, the healthcare system in America is a $2.8 trillion system. Uh, to give you some context, uh, that makes it the fifth largest economy of the world. Our healthcare system is equivalent to the entire French economy. Now, just take into your mind we're going to change the French economy pretty substantially. You're not going to do that overnight. It's going to take time, it's going to be dislocating. Um, that's what we're facing. So, we have to take our current system which has peaks of greatness like Stanford, but a lot of valleys and a lot of uneven quality. We have problems with access where 50 million people don't have access to health insurance. Uh, and we have health care costs that are growing too large. We have to move all of those things. Uh, you're not going to improve quality overnight. That's going to take some time. Uh, to get access, even that's going to take time to get people into the insurance system to make sure you have enough coverage of them. Uh, and then certainly to get costs under control is going to take time because that's going to take a re-engineering of how we deliver care. We're going to have to move from single doctors or small doctors in small group practices to teams who are working. We're going to have to change how we pay doctors instead of paying them only to take care of people who are acutely ill. We're going to have to pay them to keep people healthy. All of those changes are going to take time. That's the dislocations. That's the bumps in the road. Um, and I, you know, that's going to take up roughly a, a decade of when implementation. When you hear people say, and you hear it from, I just recently heard it on the Bill Maher show, a Republican congressman, we have the best health care system in the world. What's your response to that? How many of you in this room think we have the best health care system in the world? Well, I, look, I think, <laughs> again, Schultz. I think it's a, uh, it's, uh, Again, we have peaks of greatness, and we should be clear. We have some of the greatest in the world. 
But the system as a whole is quite uneven. Almost by any metric uh, that we could use to measure it, uh, we are uneven and we're certainly not performing as well as we should. Um, every other healthcare system has defects, but they also uh, have lower costs than we do. And I think in general, uh, many systems have less uneven uh, quality. Uh, so I think it's very hard to defend the proposition that we have the best healthcare system in the world. I think the other thing is, it turns out, and you know, most of us are very well off in this audience by the looks of it, um, even for the well off in this country, uh, it always surprised me, you know, you can't get, you're not guaranteed great quality either. Uh, you know, you can go to a hospital and the rate of hospital acquired infections is high and you don't know whether it's going to be you or your neighbor. Even if you know the doctor, even if you know the president of the hospital, they can't guarantee it to you. The rate of, uh, um, you know, mistaken drug interactions, also high. So I think none of us should be satisfied, no matter how good our personal health care is, by the system because it's unpredictable what we're going to get or unpredictable if we have an emergency that we're going to get the right care. So we should all want the system to dramatically improve uh, its quality. And we also all should want the system to be able to control its costs because after all, those costs, it's not that the insurance companies are paying it. It's not that the government's paying it. It's not that business is paying it. Ultimately, we're paying it. Whether we're paying it through taxes or through lower wages, we're paying it. And so we should want our health care costs to be moderated. Why do you think that the Affordable Care Act is so, at best, misunderstood and at worst, despised? Um, so I think there are two parts to that answer. The first part is if you take it apart, tease it apart, um, people actually like various provisions. You know, I'll, I'll just be blunt. I, you know, I have a 26-year-old daughter. Uh, she's 25. She'll be 26 in November, and then she won't have coverage. But she has for the last year, as she's gone in and out of the United States, when she comes back into the United States, she has coverage through her parents' policies. Um, so that's been a big boon to us. Um, uh, so I've been a, a beneficiary, as have millions of other families, and, and a lot of upper middle class families in America, because their kids have had coverage. And you can go down various provisions. Many people, uh, seniors, have gotten rebates through the closing of the donut hole. Many people have gotten rebates because of the uh, uh, provision that insurance companies can't make excessive profits. You know, whether you're for them or against them, many people have benefited. I think the problem is um, that there hasn't been a good communication strategy to explain to the public the bill and the rationale behind various provisions of the bill. Um, I do think the White House has not done its job in this uh, uh, as well as it should have. Um, and I think that really does center around why do we have the mandate? Why do people have to be required to buy coverage? And the real, I mean, again, going back, you have to explain to people why the mandate is absolutely essential if you want to have a situation where Insurance companies can't discriminate against people on the basis of pre-existing conditions. Those two things go together. You can't have one without the other. And I think we haven't, the public hasn't been told, and that hasn't been clearly explained to them. I don't think the American public is unreasonable. Healthcare policy is complicated. Uh, I was once uh, told by uh, Vic Fuchs, who's on the faculty here at Stanford, when uh, he and I began collaborating almost a decade ago, he says, you know, there are only two people in America who understand health policy, and one of them just died. <laughs> and it's a complicated business. It takes a lot of explanation. And as, you know, all of us know, you can't just explain it once. Richard Nixon says, you know, you say something once, you say something twice, you say it seven, eight times, you're getting sick of it. The public's just beginning to hear it. And so you have to say and explain this relationship between pre-existing conditions and the mandate over and over again for the public to understand it. And I think uh, that just hasn't been done as clearly as it could be. When you step back and look at the efforts of the Clintons, the Clinton White House versus the Obama White House, and why President Obama was able to achieve the success, what was the dynamic? Why this moment versus the failure before? <laughs> Uh, I was involved in the 93 effort, too. Um, uh, so I think, uh, I think uh, 
there are a number of components to it. Uh, one is the 93 failure did set up the uh, ability. We learned something from the 93 failure that fed into the being able to succeed in 2009. Uh, so it, it, while it was a horrible situation uh, uh, and wasted, you know, uh, uh, 15 years, uh, people actually did learn lessons and became smarter because of it. And some of the lessons we learned is, you know, you will have a lot of interest groups against you. You need to attend to those interest groups, like the pharmaceutical industry, like the insurance industry. Um, and I think that was done this time. It was also quite clear uh, that uh, the Clintons, you know, did it famously behind closed doors, kept the press out. That was a very bad mistake. The Obama administration, I think, learned uh, from that. Uh, I think you had people like my brother uh, who had been through the first episode and took lessons along. Also, I think the debate uh, among health policy experts had matured enough so that the range of options had already been pretty well vetted and a lot of the framework uh, people had, had been clear about. Uh, I would say also you had a, uh, a set of congressional leaders, uh, Nancy Pelosi, uh, she understood that you couldn't have three committees working on health care simultaneously. You had to have all of them come together. That, you know, we had five different congressional committees working on health care reform, unless there was some coherence and uniformity to that. Um, so she had them all working on the same bill instead of reporting out three different bills. So it's a lot of those elements uh, that were necessary to get this passed. And by the way, I, you know, I, I think... We're still in the sort of heat of battle. It's, it's just been a little over two years. Um, in five years from now, we're going to look back and look at this as a real world historical event. We have been trying to get health care reform in this country for 100 years, since the early 19-teens, when FDR began campaigning on it. You know, finally to get it, that's uh, pretty remarkable. And uh, I think, you know, while we're still debating the mandate and, and the constitutionality and this and that, the fact is that this is a real that this is a real world historical event. Why did the Chief Justice support it? What, what was you, you know you've now had a I've never met the Chief Justice. <laughs> I don't know. Why, what's your conjecture? Um, I know you've written about it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I would say that uh, the Chief Justice did not want it to look like a political decision. Of course, it was the most political decision that could have ever been made. Um, you know, it's a very strange decision. Uh, on the one hand, uh, he goes through this long argument as to why the Commerce Clause couldn't justify it. Typically, you don't do that in the decision. I mean, that's very unusual to explain why that argument won't work. You don't, you don't do that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's very dubious, by the way. I think, uh, you know, most, I would bet, almost all the constitutional lawyers here at Stanford Law School would say, that just doesn't work. There, there's a long list a pedigree of very conservative justice, uh, very conservative legal scholars, whether you're thinking about Charles Freed, the Solicitor General under Reagan and Harvard Law School professor, uh, or Justice Silberberg, the head of the D.C. Circuit. Uh, clearly this falls within the Commerce Clause. It, I mean, it's open and shut. And that the Chief Justice said it didn't is a little weird. I mean, the, the distinction between activity and inactivity just doesn't hold here. Uh, but I think he also wanted to insulate the court from the charge of being politicized mm -hmm. uh, because it is on the verge of being, uh, it's, ver it, it, it's, it's approval rating, the, the sense of the public that it's actually deciding things as a matter of law as, a, as opposed to a matter of politics, is at its, its lowest level. And so I think uh, he wants to protect the institution. Mm -hmm. And I think this was a protect the institution uh, uh, justification. So that's one. And the second is, look, I mean, the coming term is going to be another extremely political term with affirmative action uh, at the top of the list. And I think, uh, you know, this somewhat, I think, it, it, they think will insulate them. We'll see. I uh, heard that you had a bet with Scalia that it wouldn't pass the Congress, and you won that bet. Yes. And that was a dinner. So um, uh, I'm a, uh, I like to bet dinners. I, have, I know it doesn't look like it, but I actually like food a lot. And I eat a lot of food, and I like to go to good restaurants. And... Um, uh, three days after the Scott Brown election, we happened to be at a dinner together, sitting across each other. And we got into a conversation about 
many things, Social Security, the pay of Supreme Court justices. Um, <laughs> and uh, he said, well, you know, the Affordable Care Act's not going to pass. And if it did pass, it'd be good for us. And uh, well, I said, no, I do think it's going to pass. And you know, this was a pretty lunatic thing to say after we, Scott Brown had just been elected. And uh, he said, and I said, you know, I'll bet you. And he said, well, you know, I'll bet you $5. I said, you know, I don't bet $5. I bet dinners. And he said, well, no, I can't afford it. And then we got, a, <laughs> we got around to the discussion. And he said, well, he doesn't take Social Security because he doesn't need it. And I said, wait, 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 wait. I detect a contradiction here. On the one hand, you can't afford a bet on dinner. But on the other hand, you don't need Social Security. Um, so he said, I guess you got me there. And I said, all right, so we'll have a dinner. Uh, we'll bet a dinner. And obviously, it looked pretty bad for me. I mean, it was a, I didn't t even take odds. And maybe not the <laughs> smartest thing to do. And so uh, uh, yes, and he was a, I will say, he was a gentleman about it. We went out to a very, very nice dinner. Uh, and he's a wonderful uh, uh, dinner companion. You, tour. you can argue with him about anything. He's no whole bars. He's very funny. Uh, he's a very warm individual. And uh, that doesn't mean you agree with his politics or agree with the, you know, the way he uh, judges things. We ha we've had long arguments about Citizen United. Uh, subsequently, I invited him out to dinner. And subsequently, I've had him over to my house for dinner. And so we do. Uh, socialize, but we do not agree. And uh, now, you see, know. the price of coming here today was learning that about Justice Scalia. <laughs> so. I, you know, I, I, one of the questions that I think is fundamental to this whole debate on health care is what level of health care should be entitled every American? So the bill has this provision that uh, you have to provide essential benefits. Uh, it doesn't define essential benefits. It defines a process for trying to articulate essential benefits. Uh, the Institute of Medicine uh, came out with a uh, report uh, uh, about that. Uh, it also did not articulate the essential benefits that should go in. But it, it does pose this sort of, I think, lays down clearly a trade-off between comprehensiveness, covering every possible benefit, and affordability. The more you cover, the less affordable it's going to be. The more you try to get affordability, you are going to have to trim and uh, uh, be more prudent in what you cover. And I think that's a trade-off all of us are going to, uh, I think all of us should face. Uh, it's irresponsible for us to say we're not going to ignore how much it costs. And it's irresponsible for us to say you know, it's, it, we can have just a very, very thin package, only catastrophic coverage. And I think that is a, that's always going to be a dynamic situation. Um, but I do think uh, uh, too much, and I'll, I'll say this as, a, as an ethicist, too much we have said you know, additional services without thinking about the affordability and the consequences if we have a very comprehensive package and it's very expensive. Because there are serious consequences of a very expensive health care package. So let me just give you a few of them. The more expensive our health care is, the harder it is to cover everyone. We know that. And even in this new system under the Affordable Care Act, there are going to be some people who are going to feel like they can't afford health care, even with the subsidies, even with the exchange bringing insurance costs down. And so I think that, you know, even by the projections of the uh, Congressional Budget Office, we're going to get to 94, 95, 96% coverage. That's not 100%. Uh, and part of that reason is going to be affordability. Second problem is high health care costs uh, are impacting the states. Uh, you know, all of you in California probably know it better than anyone else. When you have high health care costs, you have high Medicaid costs. And that puts the states in a bind. You can pay for Medicaid under those conditions. And it's not just Medicaid, by the way. It's also high state employee health insurance costs. And you can pay for those costs by raising taxes. Well, in California, that's an anathema. You can't raise taxes, as is true in most of the country. Right? And then you know, the government officials are stuck in with a dilemma of what do you cut to pay for health care? And we've all seen the consequence. Maybe we, it hasn't hit us straight in the eye. but. The cuts to primary and secondary schools, the cuts to higher education, and as a consequence, the dramatic increase in tuitions at the great universities of the University of California, those are all very closely tied to increases in health care costs. Now, we may not want to see it that way. It may look like a fudge, but 
That's the way it is. You know, we should see that the increase at the UKL system in the tuition is a direct result of health care cost increase. And the third one, which I think is very important for all of us, is you know, wages have been flat. And one reason wages have been flat for the last 30 years is because health care costs have gone up and up and up and taken more of that increase in wages. But why wasn't that economic message that you've just talked about a central part of the sales of the Affordable Care Act? Well, I think the president did go around and talk about the importance of cost control. And he did say that that was an essential issue and essential motivation for him in advocating health care. And let, let me add the fourth item, uh, which is that the growth of health care spending is the major threat to the deficit, uh, the major cause of the deficit, and therefore the major threat to the fiscal stability of the country. Um, and that the president did say over and over again. And I know that it's out there, you know, a decade or so from now, and so it doesn't seem so pressing. But uh, remember, uh, you know, the international monetary markets, uh, they don't give you a lot of warning before they suddenly say, man, we don't trust your currency, and we're going to drive it down uh, to the ground. I think that was a, I think all of those were major motivations. You know, whether the communication strategy was the best around these is, you know, I wasn't the communications guru. I'm not mm -hmm. the communications guru. I'm a policy wonk, and so. You've talked about some interventions that I want to talk about, and you've spoken about these very high-cost interventions that are low-value treatments, and you spoke about, too, Avastin. You're really going to get me in trouble. Yeah, I'm going to try. Okay. You're talking about Avastin, which costs 880 no, it's 88,000 per year per patient for metastatic breast cancer. And the other one is proton B therapy targeted for prostate cancer in men. And these two, I think that you've really stated that these two are microcosms of the difficulty of changing the system. If we can't throw out treatments that aren't working, that aren't cost beneficial, how can we change the system? So let me... Uh dissect at least one of those, the proton beam one. Um, and I say that uh, working at an institution that has a proton beam uh, facility. Uh, proton beam is, uh, you have to generate it by uh, having a uh, accelerator. It's basically a hydrogen atom with the electron stripped off. You need a football field size building to contain the accelerator. Um, they're very expensive to build, uh, around about $100 million. Actually, Mayo's building two of them at $180 million each because they've got, they're really souped up. Um, now, the proton beam therapy is proven to be beneficial for kids with brain tumors and spinal cord tumors uh, because you can focus them very precisely and you spare the healthy tissue around the tumor and you really focus in on the tumor. And for kids whose brains are developing, it's been shown that you can have less cognitive decline, less impede, uh, uh, effect on their brain power, and less uh, um, hearing loss when the tumor is near uh, uh, their ear uh, pieces. And uh, it's beneficial. I guess the good news is we don't have that many kids who get brain tumors, only 3,000 a year. You can't run very many machines on 3,000 kids a year. And so, one of the consequences is we have roughly 20 of those machines, uh, 20, I forget the exact number at the moment. Uh, I think, well, whatever. We have way too many, 12, 14 uh, of those machines now up and running. And you don't need as many as we have for the kids, the just 3,000 kids. And so people who have the machines are looking around for other diseases where that might be effective. So they tried it on breast cancer and esophageal cancer and gastric cancer and uh, um, pancreatic cancer. And they've landed on treating men with early stage prostate cancer with it. Uh, the only problem is there's not a shred of evidence that it makes any difference compared to regular radiation treatment. Uh, as a matter of fact, there are some shreds of evidence that it's actually worse uh, and um, it's uh, more than twice as expensive. Um, now, that just doesn't seem to me a deal that we should want our insurance companies. Forget, you know, we, certainly we don't want Medicare paying for it because if it's no better and twice as expensive, all of us are paying that bill because we pay taxes. And we should also shouldn't want our insurance companies paying for it because it's a, the exact same situation, right? 
we pay premiums, and if they're spending money on things that aren't effective, you know, it raises my premium too. And I think that is a, it's very indefensible in my opinion. Um, and I do not see why an insurance company should cover it. I, you want it? You want to pay the money for it? More power to you. But I don't think that as a system, this goes back to your question about essential benefits. In my opinion, it's quite clear that should not be part of the essential benefits. We should not be paying for that. That raises the cost without improving the quality. I don't want to impede your willingness to pay for it. And you know, if you're, you've got that kind of money and that's your choice, I'm all for it. Uh, that's the American way. But it's not, you should not ask me and the rest of the American public to pay for you, which is essentially what you do when insurance pays for it and Medicare pays for it. Isn't that rationing? No, that is definitely not rationing. Um, I, I, so I'm just going to, uh, first of all, I'm going to plug. Can I plug my course? Sure. Okay. Uh, at the moment, at the University of Pennsylvania, I'm teaching a course called Rationing and the Allocation of Resources. Uh, actually, this last Wednesday, uh, we had uh, 45 minutes on the definitions of rationing. That course will be publicly available for free on the Great Stanford Coursera program. Uh, coming in the spring, in uh, probably be available in March or April. Um, but it's not rationing. So rationing is when you have an absolutely scarce resource. You can't cover everyone who needs it, and you have to pick people. So the classic examples are: we don't have enough livers in this country for everyone who needs a liver transplant. We do about 6,000 a year, and there are about 16,000 people on the waiting list. And even if we got every liver from everyone who was a suitable donor, we wouldn't have enough. That's rationing. Similarly, if we, God forbid, have a great flu pandemic, we won't have enough vaccine for everyone to go around. Picking who gets it, creating a list, that would be rationing. This is not rationing. Proton beam does not work, and is not proven to work for men with early stage prostate cancer, not covering it is not rationing. How do we get around the word and grapple with that word rationing, which is oftentimes the elephant in the room? How do you think as a country, we, as a nation, we come to some understanding of what is rationing versus what is not rationing? Well, I tried to just defi define it for yeah. everyone. I'm giving a course to try yeah. to help people <laughs> understand it. I mean, what else do you want yeah. me to do? I mean, I do think, you know, trying to explain it, try to put the category where it is, work, it's necessary, and then talk about other stuff where it's really not a case of rationing, and I think saying it over and over again. And I do think calling people out who are simply using it to raise people's blood pressure and get people riled up where it's inappropriate is very, very important. We cannot let, in my opinion, uh, that kind of irresponsible... Uh, uh, discussion, rule the day, and govern our uh, uh, debates. As uh, the great Senator Pat Moynihan said, you know, you're entitled to your opinion. You are not entitled to the facts. You cannot just make up definitions for words to, you know, promote your opinion. There are de reasons we have words. They have meanings. We need to stick to those meanings. And we need to enforce that as a public and say, you know, we're not going to put up with that kind of uh, uh, statement that really deviates from the case of using the words properly. And, you know, the same thing happened with the death panels. We'll talk about that in a minute. I just oh, wanted to... Uh, really? <laughs> you're, you're making my day here. <laughs> I'm trying to. You know, you've long uh, preached about the inefficiencies in the healthcare system. And just last week, as many of you know in this room, the Institutes of Medicine said America's healthcare system has become too complex. We know that. And costly to continue business as usual. We know that also. The committee calculated about 30% of healthcare spending in 2009, roughly $750 billion, was wasted on unnecessary services, excessive of administrative costs, fraud, and other problems. So where do we, we, we now know that information. We've known that information. Where do we go with the low-hanging fruit to get at the efficiencies? So uh, let me just reemphasize. Uh, it is important that the Institute of Medicine uh, uh, came to that conclusion. That's the, I think, fourth report uh, that uh, has highlighted round about that same number. So you can come to that by saying, all right, let's look at each place that we're running the system and 
how much could we save by best guesses and by studies. That's what the Institute of Medicine did. You could go and compare the United States to Europe and say, well, if we were running in the same way that Europe was running, how much could we save? That's what the McKinsey Institute did. Uh, you can do this by saying, well, let's look at our best performing states and compare them to our worst performing states. And if we brought our worst performing states up to our best performing states, how much could we save? They all turn out to coalesce and overlap round about six, seven, $750 billion. And again, just to put that in context, you know, we $2.8 trillion, even if we don't get all of that money, even if we get only a quarter of that, or, you know, that's $175 billion. That's a lot of money. A lot of money. That's almost two years of healthcare inflation there. It's more money than it's going to cost to get all the people onto the healthcare system. So we have to be very clear uh, about that. So what are the kinds of things we need to do? And there's, a, 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 I think, a pretty good list of uh, uh, approaches that are going to help us get some of that out. One is we do know that a large, we have a large administrative inefficiency. Some of that's built into the fact that we're a federalist country and we have 50 states and insurance companies have to go through 50 regulations and we have lots of uh, of different regulations. We also have a lot of different billing systems, but there's all, almost everyone who's looked at it, there are low-hanging fruit. Consolidate the, uh, have the same uh, billing system, have the same way of credentialing doctors, one central uh, way. M require everyone to bill in the same way. So, you know, you have a swipe card, it pulls up the information, uh, you have electronic claims processing rather than having someone in the doctor's office put it in uh, by hand and make a mistake. Lots of technologies there. One of the things that I'm very proud of, uh, uh, myself and actually sitting here, Bob Kocher, who worked with me, uh, we were together, he worked at NEC. We pushed and championed and took a lot of slings and arrows for pushing in the Affordable Care Act steps along the way to create administrative efficiencies and administrative simplification. And some of those rules have gone into place, and over the next few years, more are going to go into place. It won't get us the $30 billion in savings that everyone thinks we can get, but it'll get us pretty far down the line. There's more we can do in that regard. Second, I think indispensable to getting rid of some of this inefficiency is changing how we pay doctors and hospitals. If you ask me what's the core that we need to do over the next decade to really fix the system, we have to change how we pay. Right now, 80 plus percent of payment is on what's called fee for service. That is a doctor sees you or you get admitted to the hospital, they get a fee, ka-ching. You know, you go in for surgery, the surgeon charges, the anesthesiologist charges, the radiologist charges, the pathologist will charge, there's a hospital operating room fee and on and on and on, right? That encourages more volume, right? You get paid more the more you do. It also doesn't encourage coordination, and it certainly doesn't encourage keeping you healthy. Because if I keep you healthy, you never make it to the operating room, I lose all that dough. That is not a very good business practice. And so one of the things we have to do, you know, if we really want this system, quote unquote, which keeps people healthy and has the healthcare system focusing on keeping people healthy, we have to change how we pay doctors and hospitals. That change, I believe, going to initially bundling, that is putting all of that together. So instead of paying the surgeon and the radiologist and the anesthesiologist and the hospital all separately and the rehabilitation doc, you put it all together in one price. Well, that encourages them to collaborate, become efficient, uh, get the unnecessary stuff out. We have to go a step beyond the bundling. We have to say, all right, you're going to take care of this patient. We're giving you one price for this patient for the whole year. It's called global uh, uh, payment. And that really says, oh, look, even if we're efficient once they get in and we give them surgery, we can actually do better if we prevent them from getting in. They don't even need the surgery. So if they're a diabetic and we can work really hard to make sure that they don't get a cut. And if they get a cut, we clean it out and they don't get gangrene. And if they get gangrene, it doesn't progress so that we need to amputate. Uh, that is the secret sauce that is going to, I think, transform the system. Because then you're going to get the whole healthcare system focusing on how do we keep these people healthy. And then I think that leads to several 
avenues. First, it leads to working in teams, not just an individual doctor, it's doctors with nurses, with dietitians, with pharmacists, with rehabilitation people. Second, it gets the healthcare system thinking outside the four walls of the healthcare system. Instead of just focusing on what goes on in the doctor's office or the hospital, you know, most patients don't spend their lives right, in the doctor's office and hospitals, they spend it at home. We gotta think about what, what are they doing at home? How do we increase their compliance with their medications? How do we increase their compliance with the diet? How do we make sure that they're actually getting physical activity? And again, unless we incentivize the system to begin focusing there, you know, they're not going to focus there. And so I think the payment is the key catalytic change. What is some of the most, you traveled around the country quite a bit, what are some of the most exciting things you're seeing taking place in the clinic around the country that goes to the heart of what you've just talked about, incentivizing? Um, I get paid nothing for this, okay? So I'm going to plug uh, uh, the one which I, at least at the moment, I'm, uh, I think is, is a real leader in this area. But there are lots of experiments going on in various different places. Uh, but one that I'm most impressed with is CareMore, which is center, ha, ha, uh, centered in Southern California, now has some clinics in uh, Arizona, Nevada, and is expanding. And um, they get a global payment to take care of elderly people, and they do a huge, I mean, again, they focus on the team. A new uh, elderly person gets enrolled. They have a two-hour visit, go through everything, their history, their drugs. They get a screen for dementia. They get a screen for depression, mental health. Turns out that about 17% of their elderly patients newly arrived have signs of depression. Uh, they have a team taking care of they put in a lot of infrastructure to monitor them at home. Weights that get communicated in uh, regularly. Uh, um, hemoglobin A1C for diabetics that gets communicated in. Uh, breathing for patients with emphysema. They have specialized clinics. Again, I mentioned the diabetic and the, and the wound. They have specialized clinics for diabetic wound care where the doc doesn't do it you know, once every few weeks in his office. They have one nurse who's superb at it. And the patients go there and get, and get the treatment. They do things that are usually not covered by insurance, things like exercise and balance classes so that elderly people don't trip or fall over. They sometimes replace carpeting in people's houses. They have a transportation service so that they can bring people with chronic illness in to the office so that they don't miss appointments where the next stop is, well, the emergency room, then a the hospital admission, and on. They have remarkable results. Their diet, their Amputation rate among diabetics about 60% lower than the competition. Their hospital admissions about 38% lower than the competition. Their readmission rate for their patients is 10%, whereas the national average for these patients is 20%. They uh, are 15 to 30% cheaper than the competition. So what I like to call this is they just spend a huge amount of attention on people with chronic illness in an effort to keep them healthy and out of the clutches of the healthcare system. And that, turns out, it's not by saying no, not by denying care. It's actually by keeping people healthy that they're able to really both improve the quality of life of these people and keep the cost of the healthcare system down. And, one, and that's, just, that's just one example. There are uh, many other places that have tried similar things. But that's the transformation that you're going to see, I think, over the next decade. And another transformation we're seeing right now is big medicine. Do you have concerns about this consolidation of the industry? Is it inevitable when you have these pressures on dollars that you can't have singular physicians anymore, you can't have small practices, you have to have big medicine? And do you see dangers in that? Uh, the answer is yes to both, mm -hmm. uh, which is um, uh, having single or groups of two physicians has certain appeal. but. Uh, you have to have an infrastructure behind them. To provide high quality medicine today, it can't just be an isolated doctor or two. You need the infrastructure because it's got to have electronic records. It has to have other health care providers beyond the doctors, as I mentioned, nurses, dietitians, physical therapists. Uh, you also need to have a, a, a computer system that has support services. You need to have access 24-7 if you're going to be, I think, high quality. Um, uh, so I think somehow it doesn't have to be 
uh, big medicine, but it has to be a, a, a network in some way that connects doctors. And I think there are going to be various different forms of this. We don't know the best form, and I'm not sure there is a single best form. There's probably going to be multiple ways of doing the same delivery. Uh, I do think small practices, given the right infrastructure and right affiliations, can probably survive. We'll see whether they do. Um, nonetheless, I do think that there's always a worry of big medicine, a worry of impersonal, uh, 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 to the, impersonal to the experience, worry about the fact that it's unresponsive to individual patients, worry that consolidation will also raise prices. Um, so I think there are very legitimate worries about big medicine. I also think in terms of delivering co con continuity of care and focusing on keeping people healthy, it's also probably inevitable. You tried to have a conversation during the healthcare debate about end-of-life issues, and end-of-life conversations usually typically take place 33 days before a patient dies, and 80% of people say they want to die at home, but only 10% do. Well, I, I don't know that that last number is correct, but anyway. Well, I'll give you those I'll, numbers. Okay. It's, how do we, if we're not able to get into a sane debate in a period of time when we're talking about this issue, how do we move the country forward in having this adult conversation about end-of-life issues? All right, so now it's my turn to talk about the glass being half full. When I started in the end-of-life care uh, era 25 years ago, um, actually more than 25, almost 30 years ago, God, am I getting old. Uh, you know, I, I left Harvard Medical School as a student and told the uh, dean that I was going to go and work uh, on a PhD and part of my focus was going to be end-of-life care. And he basically said to me, um, well, that'll be a career ender. We don't talk about end-of-life care in medicine. Um, and, you know, being a sort of pig-headed and not very good at listening to what people were telling me, I still did it. Um, and then, you know, lo and behold, at the end of the 80s, it really did come on the agenda. But when I left, uh, more than 70% of cancer patients in America were dying in a hospital. Today, it's under, certainly under 30% and probably under 25%. That's a huge change. Uh, hospice was pretty much nowhere to be found. I mean, there were a few isolated hospices. Among cancer patients now, hospice is just one of the treatments. Now, we might give it too late, but we certainly, every oncologist has used it, uses it regularly. Um, and again, we might not use it optimally, just like we don't use our chemotherapy necessarily optimally, but we're very comfortable with it. It's not necessarily true of every cardiologist, but I think it, it's expanding. Uh, it was a forbidden topic, you know, as my dean said, you know, it's a career ender. It's not that, you know, we have a whole cadre of, of people who are doing research on how to improve it now, whereas, you know, there were probably four of doctors in the 80s who were, you know, focused on this uh, at all. So I think we've actually made huge progress as a society. We haven't made as much progress as we should or as we like, and there's plenty of stuff we can do to make it better. What can we do to make and, it better? Well, let me just say why I think the, the, I actually think the death panels thing backfired. Most of the public does want to have a discussion of this and wants to have, as you point out, their views and preferences on this respected better. What they don't understand is how does the system have to change to make that work for them? And that's, I think, where the death panel scare can get some perch. But for most people, they would like the system to respond better to them and their loved ones. So what do I think is necessary? Let's be honest. We don't know yet. We don't know the, the optimal strategy. But here are some things that Here's what we were trying to do in the Affordable Care Act. And again, my, my colleague Bob Kocher and I uh, worked on this together. Um, so one thing which I think is essential is communication, training doctors and nurses about communication around end-of-life care. Look, I'm an oncologist. Is that an a, a, uh, interaction I like to have with my patient? You know, We've tried every chemotherapy. They're not working. I'm sorry, but sometime in the next few months, you are going to die. No. You know, I would put it off as long as possible. Who wants to have that conversation? Right? Plus, they didn't teach me how to have that conversation in medical school. Well, one of the things we have today is we actually have people who've worked out 
trainings on that conversation that can make doctors feel more, and nurses feel more comfortable about having that conversation. That's really critical, it seems to me. And one of the things, you know, why don't we require training on communication around end-of-life care? I don't mean general training about communication with patients on end-of-life care. And I think that would be a big, big uh, uh, step in the right direction, whereas we wouldn't be afraid of, as afraid of it. I mean, again, it's never going to be a pleasant conversation, but we wouldn't be as afraid of it. Second, we do need to have a better infrastructure for taking care of patients uh, who are dying at home and giving them palliative therapies. Yes, great academic institutions have good palliative care services. You go to, you know, the other 4,500 4, hospitals in America, not true. We do need to have a way that every hospital has good palliative care, access to good palliative care services that ca people can address the symptoms of patients and make it work. I think those two things go a long way towards uh, making it better. And then one of the things I think we're going to find out over the next decade is what else works in this space? Um, and uh, I think that is, you know, again, one of the more interesting and exciting things we're going to learn over the next uh, 10 years. But I think if, if I had to play around with it, I would focus commun on communication uh, by the healthcare team and on guaranteeing that every patient, no matter what, can have access to good palliative care. What about time? I mean, Phil Pizzo has pointed out in, in Anna DeVere Smith's play, Let Me Down Easy, <laughs> that their time is the essence of why people, why physicians don't talk about these issues. They don't have the time to sit down, and time is a real significant barrier also to the discussion. So uh, it is a significant barrier. I think training people will help. They'll figure out how to get the conversation right. I do think uh, the third thing I actually left out, and, and thank you for correcting me, is we do need to pay doctors for this conversation. It's not like the conversation doesn't take time. And we should pay and compensate them for a conversation about advanced care preferences with patients and for conversations when you have to make a critical decision. It's not like that doesn't happen. So let's recognize that it takes time, and therefore doctors should be compensated for that. And I think, uh, uh, so thanks for correcting me. That's the third leg of the stool. Uh, we do need communication training. We need access to palliative care so you have an infrastructure to give it, and we need to compensate doctors for doing it. Again, that's not going to make me rush into the room and do it. It means, though, that you're going to reduce the barriers and the inhibitions. You proposed the creation of a Children's Opportunity Bequest Fund. Can you flesh that out for us? Why? What's the thinking behind that? What's the idea? Um, so... One of the things, and I guess this is because I'm the son of a pediatrician, uh, but um, I think over the last, uh, uh, I don't know, 30, 40 years, we have underinvested in our children. You know, one of the common tropes in American political life is our children are our most valuable asset. Well, we actually don't believe that if you look at our actions. If you look at the federal government, the uh, ratio uh, in the federal budget of how much we spend on seniors versus how much we spend on children is seven to one. Seven dollars goes to seniors for every one dollar that goes to kids. And it seems to me most of us find, would find that disturbing, right? We're, kids are our most valuable asset. They're our future. They're the future of the American populace. Um, most of us think, you know, we're not doing enough in their education. Uh, there's probably a lot more we can do about obesity, about their exercise, about getting, keeping them in school. Um, so on the other hand, you know, no one wants to give up their slice of the federal budget. For one thing, if I give it up, there's no guarantee it's going to go to kids, right? Who knows where it goes in the federal budget? It's like a big black hole. So my, you know, sitting back and saying, well, how do you motivate people to say, all right, I'm willing to give up something for kids. Well, one of the things I think that motivates, would motivate people is, I'm willing to give it up for my grandchildren. Um, and so you would say, well, I would go either without Social Security for a couple of extra years or without 
Medicare for a couple of extra years, and I would assume the cost if I could redirect that money to this Social Security number, which happens to be my grandson. Now, if you're wealthy, I think, you should have to, if you want to give it to your grandchildren, that would be great, but you'd also have to match that by giving it to a pot that would go to kids who either don't have grandparents who are so wealthy and can afford to do it, or really aren't you know, related to grandparents because of however they've been born. Uh, and that, that would go to someone within your zip code so that it would build up your community, a poor kid be, be, who, who raised beneath the poverty line. It, was an, it is an idea that I think of how do you motivate people who I think really genuinely would like to give to their kids and to children uh, to motivate them to give it. As a, someone who wrote me uh, after I published that said, you know, most old people don't want to be, you know, well off while kids are, you know, in poverty. That just doesn't make sense to them. On the other hand, the mechanism, the way to solve that problem is not obvious. We haven't created it. You know, let me just give you another statistic about how bad I think we, uh, we are in this society around uh, kids and, and elderly people. So in the 1960s, around a third of people over 65 were under the poverty line. We've brought that down to under 9% now in America. It's a great success, right? Over 90% of elderly people are above the, living above the poverty line. We've done just the opposite with our children. You know, we have, I think, a quarter of kids are now born below the poverty line. 40% of kids are on Medicaid. You know, it's a horrible statistic. We should not be proud of that. We have to figure out how to rebalance that. And it seems to be this sort of bequest idea or creating a fund that can be directed to, to children is my attempt to think through how do you create an infrastructure that allow people and encourage people to uh, give to their children. We're going to take questions from the audience in one minute, but I want to close with two things. One is that you're an optimist. You really believe that we can turn this health care system around with all of its significant issues, with all of the funding problems, with all of the problems at efficiency. You do see a sun at the end of whatever may be the darkness and route. Yes. So I have a slide when I give my usual stand-up presentation, uh, my stump speech, I call it, and it, uh, at the top says, I am an optimist, I say, uh, and I think guaranteed by 2020, Guaranteed by 2020, the healthcare system will be better than it is today. How can I say that? How can I be sure about that? First, on the access side, we will have an infrastructure, exchanges, Medicaid coverage, that'll get everyone in the country access to health insurance. That's a big improvement. Two, on the quality side, every one of you is going to have an electronic health record, which is going to be interchangeable, interoperable, it'll be accessible. Hospital acquired infections, hospital mistakes will be down. They are going to decrease. We're providing incentives. Hospitals are working diligently across the country to do that. Readmission rates are going to come down. We're spending a lot of money in developing new quality metrics so that we'll really be able to assess doctors and hospitals and we'll finally be able to know whether the Mayo Clinic is the Mayo Clinic. We'll have data that will allow us to know. And on the cost side, all of those things are going to save some money, I, and I think together we'll save more money. And I think we are going to probably try a lot more in terms of payment reform, and it's going to have an effect. We are going to have these experiments like Care More, uh, like Group Health's experiment in Puget Sound, like the Mass General's experiment with Medicare patients, uh, like Intermountain Healthcare's provision. We're going to find out different models that work, and they are going to spread around the country. So. Again, I'm not predicting it by 2014. I'm not predicting it by 2015. By the end of the decade, we will definitely see a measurable improvement. And more importantly, I think actually the trajectory is going to be in the right direction. Will you come back in 2020 and talk about that? If you get me food, I'll come back. <laughs> um, well, I just want a final question is that uh, you have a new book coming out in November. And the name of the book is... No, no, no February. 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 And February. the name of the book is Brothers Emanuel about Ari, Ram, and Zeke. Tell us just a little bit about the book. It's about our growing up. You have to see the rest, you know. 
I can't give you the stories now before okay. the book comes out. But they're good. You'll enjoy it. Some of it's funny. Some of it is, I can't believe I did that kind of stuff. And you'll understand why we are the way we are. So, pushy. Zeke Emanuel. Zeke Emanuel, thank you for joining me. Thank you. So we're going to take questions from the audience. I think we're going to, we have a microphone right there. Thank you. Uh, Theral Timson with Mendel's Pod. We're a media site for the life sciences and biotech. So going back to um, the discussion on costs, yeah. um, we look at it as, oh, costs are so bad. But in a way, we've really been the victim of our own success. I mean, there's been so many new technologies developed, med device, new therapeutics, a lot here at Stanford, um, which are good. I mean, and so the population's getting older. We're treating people more. Is there a new way we can look at health care um, so that it's not, oh, costs are bad? But um, I don't know, just a, a new so, model. So first of all, I think it's really, really important. I am all for innovation and innovation in the healthcare space. But we have to distinguish between true innovation and false innovation. True innovation are advances, whether drugs or devices or new surgical techniques, that either save lives, reduce side effects, reduce costs, easier to administer, right? Those are worth paying for. There's no doubt about it. When we take a pill that lowers our bad cholesterol and is shown to prolong life, reduce heart attacks and prolong life, that's a really good in innovation, really good innovation. On the other hand, when we build proton beam machines at $180 million and they're not proven to do anything except in this very small category of kids, that's not a true innovation. That's a lot of money for what exactly? And so I think one of the problems in the current system is we have a lot of incentives to create very high and expensive innovations that aren't true innovations. They're false innovations. Yes, they're glitzy. They're shiny. You can advertise for them, but they don't, haven't been proven to improve health. And I can give you a long list of those. Now, what I'm hoping over the next decade, and I think it's already begun to be borne out, is we're going to uh, we're going to incentivize innovations that do exactly what we want them to do. Improve quality, improve longevity, decrease side effects, and do it at a lower cost. And that's what we want to encourage. And I'm worried we should not just talk about all new technology as if somehow it's undifferentiatedly good. New technology that doesn't improve health you know, and costs a lot of money, that's not a good thing. You will see, however, if you've got new technology that improves longevity, improves the quality of life, decreases side effects, is more convenient, people are going to pay for that. And that's been our problem. We've incentivized the wrong thing. And I do think we're going to fix those incentives. And I can give you a long list. You know, recently uh, uh, device maker uh, wanted a new device for to hold the patella during a knee replacement went to the Royal College of Art, right? If you wanted a new device, wouldn't you go to a college of art to get it, right? They actually have a division in London that does medical devices. They redesigned it. Instead of heavy stainless steel, it was injection mold plastic. Instead of reusable and sterilizable, it was disposable, so no infection problems. And it turned out to be more accurate than the heavy stainless steel one. And one-tenth the price, right? Now, that's, that's a true innovation. Better quality, lower price. There's a, another one, a new bottle top for medication, those prescription pills, to encourage people to take it. So there's a light on it, an LED, that is green when you're supposed to take it and turns to red when you take it. And if by 11 o'clock in the morning you haven't taken it, it sends a message to your doctor. It also sends a message to your relatives. And by the way, when you get down to 10 pills left, it sends a message to the pharmacist. Hasn't been fully tested, but a small, relatively small trial at Mass General 
showed that compliance with that one as opposed to the usual went from 70% compliance to 98% compliance. That's a true innovation. These are the kind of things that need to be incentivized, not you know, $10 million machines that aren't proven to be advantageous at all. And that, I think, is where we need to head. Right over here. Hi, Karen Duncan, an independent health policy researcher. Uh, you've talked a great deal about cost and uh, to a certain extent about access, but uh, I want to ask you a quality question. Would you comment on the adequacy of medical education given the de intellectual and professional demands that, uh, that accountable care, for example, makes on physicians? I'm not sure that's a quality question so much as a medical education question. And I actually, uh, and I appreciate the question because uh, I have written a little bit, uh, but I uh, uh, will begin writing a lot more about uh, the fact that we have to change the medical education system for the uh, next century, I believe. Uh, we're clearly not educating our uh, medical students, I think, uh, for the coming uh, way they're going to practice. Uh, we need to do a lot better training in terms of teams. Uh, the practice is going to evolve to, as I mentioned, not just single doctors, but you're going to work on a team. That's a different dynamic than the way we've been trained. Uh, and probably we need to do something different in medical school. I don't know whether it's co-educate with nurses and pharmacists and others. I think that would probably wouldn't be a bad idea. Um, second, one of the things we're going to have to have is a lot more management training of doctors. Now, I know that's an anathema. That business school over there you know, and the medical school, they don't get together. And I know that certainly through my training, we look down upon them. But let's be serious. How we build teams. Really, it's not just you didn't learn that in the womb. You have to learn certain things about it. Negotiation, we're constantly negotiating with patients, with nurses, with fellow doctors, with hospitals. We need training in that. How to use data to improve care. How to run lots of small experiments in improvement. Get the information on whether it works or not and change. Rapid cycle improvement, we need training on that. Finances, we need some training on that. Leadership, again, most doctors aren't born with it. I think there's a whole series of those things that we need to incorporate in medical school. And I have long suggestions about lots of things we should get out of medical school. And I think uh, uh, I'm not abashed to say that most of the first two years of my medical school I found, um, if not completely worthless, pretty close, right. <laughs> you know, it's not clear to me that I ever used the Krebs cycle uh, <laughs> in medical school or the Starling Law. So I think, I think, you know, if you don't want to reduce the first two years to nothing, you can certainly reduce it to a year. Duke has shown that. Um, that saves you a lot of time to do other things uh, and I think easily within the four years and I would actually say even within three years we could get what we need to. But I do think that's going to have to change and it's going to have to change a lot more rapidly than it has changed in the last hundred years. We'll go to the back. Here the schools do talk to each other. Well, you're on one campus and you're one of four major, you know, right. one of four leading universities where that's true. I happen to be on the other one, and I do think it makes a huge amount of difference. In the back. Hi, my name is Kimberly Lovett. I'm a family physician. I'm also a student at Stanford Law School right now. Um, thank you very much for coming. What an inspirational talk you gave. Um, I do want to ask a question. You were talking about global payments, and you were talking about a model of care that did show that um, they reduce their cost of healthcare spending, they also increase the quality. One concern that I've heard about something like global payments or bundled payments is that potentially um, physicians start to make less money. And of course, every other country where they do show better you know, healthcare quality, lower costs, physicians are paid a lot less on average than our physicians in this country. And um, I'm wondering how you rectify that and that sort of necessary thing to happen when we do pay so much more for our education here. I mean, I already have $250,000 of debt, and, um, and of course, law school is not going to be helping that. Um, but you know, you, you got to wonder, how do we pay our physicians and, and justify that decrease? In
So uh, first thing to say is uh, I don't think uh, the approach I've recommended, either whether it's through bundled payments or through uh, global uh, payment, uh, necessarily means doctors are going to be paid less. As a matter of fact, there are many scenarios where doctors are actually paid more. Uh, um, and it depends upon how doctors uh, adjust to the system. That's the first thing. The second thing is, it is true in most European countries, uh, Japan, et cetera, that they, doctors there make less than doctors here. Simultaneously, however, our healthcare costs are 50% more than all those other countries. We have plenty of money in the system for doctors to continue to be well paid. And no one is talking about we're going to take our system from $2.8 trillion down to $2 trillion. All of this talk about controlling costs, it's controlling costs. It's controlling how fast we go up, not about going from 2.8 down to 2. That needs to be very clear. How can doctors do better, actually, in a new model system? Well, one of the ways is. Doctors could actually get paid for all of the things that they do. And if patients don't go into the hospital as frequently, if you don't have complications as much, if you don't have readmissions, there's savings there, some of which can go to the doctors and some of which can go back into the system or go back into people who are paying, paying premiums. And if you look at the ratios, hospitals are about a third of the health care spend, and doctors, are their salaries are about 10 or 12% of the total health care spend. You don't have to, ch you know, if you change uh, pay payments to hospitals by about 10%, turns out that that's a very big increase in what doctors can earn. It's about a 30% increase in what doctors can earn. So uh, there are many ways by which actually we can control costs, change how we pay without forcing doctors to have lower salaries. Over here. In front. Uh, I'm Stan Schreier, a Stanford hematologist. I think you wrote a piece in the New York Times where you identified a major cost in medical care as being the care for chronic illness. I wonder if you have some thoughts about how we can take care of patients with type 2 diabetes or chronic congestive heart failure and so forth, may, improving the quality but controlling the costs. Uh, thank you. Uh, I didn't make this point, and I probably should have. So one of the most, uh, when I teach my students at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, I say that the second most important slide in health policy is a slide that shows uh, the fact that costs in the American healthcare system are not evenly distributed. They're lumpy bumpy. 50% of the population are basically out of the healthcare system. They use 3% of the costs. They're irrelevant. Who are they? You know, they're the young adults sitting in this audience, right? They're kids. They might get a broken arm, in which case, you know, it's got to be sad, or they might get stitches, or they might have an ear infection. But they're peanuts. 10% of the population uses nearly two-thirds of the dollars. That's where the money is. That's where the quality problems are, too. Those are the people who are heavy users, and they are exactly, as you point out, people who have chronic conditions and multiple chronic conditions, whether it's diabetes, heart disease, emphysema, asthma, cancer, high blood pressure. And if we really want to improve quality and control costs, we have to focus on those patients. And as I mentioned, some of the ways to focus on them. You really need to put all of those resources in keeping them healthy, keeping them on diets, making sure that they actually measure their weight regularly, take their medications regularly, get exercise classes. Uh, when they have a problem, intervene early before it requires a hospitalization. All of those things, that's the places that have succeeded in improving the quality, like Care More, like Group Health, like other places. They focus on those patients with chronic illness. They focus on keeping them healthy. And they are able to have better quality and lower costs. And, and you're absolutely right. It's only by fo focusing on the chronically ill that we can get these two things, high quality and low cost, going together. How about um, we'll go here and then there and then in the back right here. Following up on that point about 
costs versus outcomes. You've given two examples which were easy, it seems to me. The Proton B was not a better outcome, but high cost, so you don't want that. They replaced the plastic knee as better outcome and lower cost, so you do want that. What about the middle ground where something is high, a substantially higher cost and a better outcome? Is there a way of calculating a cost per benefit, a cost per life, or cost per life per year? How do, how do you make those tough choices? And, and aren't there a big percentage of the total dollar spent in that middle ground with high cost and better outcomes? Well, I'm not sure that there's a big percentage of cost in that middle ground. I don't know that anyone's uh, differentiated it. But there's no doubt that there are a number of interventions, like the new interventions for cystic fibrosis, which have a big improvement for patients. And I think it costs a quarter of a million dollars a year. Um, and that's obviously a serious challenge uh, to the system. I think uh, I don't want to go around measuring a uh, cost-effectiveness ratio and using that as a strict way. I don't think that's uh, appropriate. On the other hand, I do think uh, if we get our payment system right and we get the practice right, we are going to find out uh, that the incentives for developing things uh, which have high cost but minimal benefits is probably going to disappear. Um, high cost, high benefits, like the cystic fibrosis uh, intervention, I think we're going to pay for that. You know, we already do pay for those kind of things. Liver transplantation, quarter of a million dollars. Well, it turns out it's, you know, 85% success rate at five years for, you know, kids and young adults. Well, no one has any problem paying for that, right? Not even the most hard-nosed, green eye shade guy is going to say, yeah, I'm not sure we should do that. No, it turns out if you're really saving life and you're really improving the quality of life of people and it's going to cost money, we're going to do that. The problem is when we're paying $100,000 and we're extending life on average two months. You know, but if you got a system that is actually paying for high quality and, you know, efficiency, it's not clear to me people are going to continue to develop those kind of interventions. Um, there, um, the woman raising her hand in the back, and then we'll go over here. Um, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, Elizabeth Oliva from the Palo Alto VA. I was just, uh, I really appreciated your analogy to um, adolescence and kind of the growing pain. So I was actually. Let me guess how old your kids are. <laughs> I had a, a question as to um, what sort of growing pains do you anticipate in the upcoming, because um, you're, you're talking about a huge cultural shift. Yeah. And so I'm just wondering what growing pains you guys are anticipating, how you're preparing for that. I mean, because a lot of the arguments as to other places that have this sort of uh, similar sort of system, there lower, you know, lower uh, or smaller SES disparity, smaller, more homogenous, those sorts of things. So I'm just wondering what you're anticipating and how you guys are preparing well, for I that. Well, I think a big, look, there's going to be a big, require a big shift and transformation on the healthcare delivery side. Doctors are going to have to shift how they care for patients. That's a big shift. Doctors and hospitals are going to have to have different kinds of relationships than we've had hitherto. That's going to be a big shift. I think patients themselves are going to have to realize that their interaction with the healthcare system is going to be very different. Let me just give you an example. You know, in Sweden, uh, if you're a healthy kid and, you know, 90 plus percent of kids are healthy kids, you see the doctor once before your 18th birthday. Yeah, the rest of the time you see nurse practitioners. All right, you know, do we do? Do my kids need to see the doctor for an otitis media for an ear infection or a strep throat swab or the latest vaccine or to tell me, you know, they're really on the growth curve? <laughs> you know, you don't really need the doctor for most of that, okay? So part of our, we need to change our expectations too. Does that mean that if I see, the, if I take my kids and they see the nurse practitioner, you know, most of the time, that somehow I'm getting lower quality? No. So I think that there's going to be an important shift on all of our parts, mainly the healthcare system, doctors, nurses, other health professionals, and hospitals. But the public has to recognize, too, uh, that you know, some of these changes, which they might not have anticipated, are also you know, probably going to be good and uh, 
Maybe they'll even be cost savings. Another one is, you know, telemedicine. A large part of, you know, 20% of America lives in rural areas. Telemedicine is probably the answer to getting them really good quality care. Well, it's a lot different than what, you know, talking to your doctor or a nurse practitioner on the television. It's probably not your first idea of high quality care, but it probably is going to be the way to get the best quality care. So I think there's going to be a lot of these unanticipated things. And, you know, look, we're all amateur psychologists, right? We know that when you have uncertainty and change and you're asked to do things different than what you're used to, you get nervous. That's why I think many people are nervous about the health care reform. They're unsure how it's going to play out. So I understand why we're all nervous, whether you're a doctor or a member of the public over, looking over the next 10 years. But I think, you know, being uncertain, we should not uh, correlate with it's going to be necessarily bad. It could also be that we actually finally see that it's going to be better. Um, and I think, again, I am the optimist. I do think it's almost assuredly, and I am willing to bet good dinners that it's going to be bet better by 2020. No one's taking me up on that, by the way. You know, I noticed that. I'll take you. Th uh, right here, row three. You, uh, sir, you, right there. Uh -huh. There you go. Oh, thank you. Uh, John Lilly, Stanford volunteer. Uh, when I hear you talk about the next eight years, uh, being bumpy. Those are the ones that concern me. I think I go along with you on dinner in 2020. But uh, uh, when I think of other industries that have gone through major transformation, it's been worse than bumpy. Uh, let's think about airline industry de deregulation as an example. Poorer service, uh, bankruptcies, uh, people out of jobs, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and if anything, just uh, payment reform in the health industry uh, is a bigger transition than airline deregulation, mm -hmm. I think, and might threaten some of our most important health institutions. Could you comment on how you see maybe some smoothing that would occur? Well, first of all, I, again, one of the reasons I try to pick 2020 or say that we should keep our eye on 2020 is because I actually do think um, the transitions are going to be Grad, more gradual. I mean, it's not like anyone has said, 2015, we're getting off fee for service, except in Arkansas. Um, so I do think, actually, uh, one of the reasons it is going to be bumpy, but I don't think it's going to be as bad as you said, is because a lot of the changes are uh, likely to be phased in. I mean, look, no one has said, when are we getting off fee for service and give us a date certain. But they're not going to, I can guarantee you, they're not giving us a date in this decade. If anything, it'll be early in the next decade. And so I think that does allow for a smooth transition. But what we do need is some certainty. I mean, what does business hate most? Uncertainty. uncertainty. Give it some certainty so they can plan out how they're going to spend their money, how they're going to lead the transformation, what are the milestones along that process. We've made a proposal uh, alluded to, but uh, you know, I'll just spell it out. What do I think? How do I think we could do this best? I think if we had the federal government say in Medicare, by 2022, we're going to have 75% of our payments off fee for service. Everyone then understands, you know, the head of Stanford Hospital, the head of the Palo Alto Health Clinic, all of them understand, all right, 2022, my business model is going to be completely different. So now I, can, I know I've got a decade to plan. Second, I think we should say, all right, so here are some milestones along that path for you. First, we should shift all cardiac, whether it's bypass surgery, stents, catheterizations, pacemaker placements, and orthopedics, hip and knee replacements. We should shift those to bundled payments. And we can do that quickly because Medicare has a bundle payment model. It's tested out. It's been shown to save money. It's been shown to improve quality. We've already worked it out. Just say, we're going to roll that out by 2014. It leads to lots of advantages because it gets the doctors and hospitals communicating. It gets them working in the same direction. That tells everyone, A, we're really serious, and B, here's the first step. 
but it's not that radical a shift, then we can say 2017, we're going to have two chronic conditions. My proposals are for a bunch of cancers, adjuvant treatment for breast cancer, colon cancer, lung cancer, where, again, the professionals, the oncologists, my colleagues have defined, here's the right way of treating people for a year. We're going to bundle that payment. Then we're going to take something like congestive heart failure or coronary uh, artery disease. We're going to bundle that. So we're going to get not just these procedures, but we're also going to begin getting chronic diseases by 2017. That gives people a glide path. And once Medicare does that, you've got private insurers that are going to do the same. And then we can expand beyond the bundle payments to global payment or other financial systems. I think that smooths out the transition. It alerts everyone to what is going to happen. That is my hope uh, uh, for the system. I've been blabbing about it for a lot of time in Washington now. And I think that would be a much better way than, you know, next year we're deregulating, which is basically the way the airline industry did it. So. Last question, right here, this woman. Thank you. Hi, I'm an undergraduate economics student writing about cost controls of healthcare plans. And you want me to read your paper? <laughs> No, um, I actually read your book, Healthcare Guaranteed, and I know you stress the use of electronic medical records, but you also mentioned that these have very high startup costs. My question is, how do you incentivize providers to actually implement? Well, these we've already done systems? it. So the Recovery Act, not the, not actually the Affordable Care Act, but the Recovery Act, uh, in that act, had uh, an incentive structure for uh, doctors and hospitals to adopt electronic health records, recognizing that their startup costs, initially they decrease productivity. And there's a network effect. You know, you can have it, but if the specialist you're referring the patient to or the laboratory aren't using it, you know, it turns out to be a big investment for not a whole lot of payout. Um, and the uptake has been tremendous uh, in terms of uh, doctors and hospitals implementing electronic health records. Um, and uh, I think, you know, by 2015, uh, you've got to implement them. Otherwise, you begin to get dinged. You get uh, payment reduction from Medicare. Um, and I think the, the fact is we've also seen a big profusion of companies working in the electronic health re record area. You know, most doctors who you talk to or most nurses who you talk to about electronic health records, you know, moan about, you know, it doesn't do this and I can't do that. Yeah, for sure. But again, by the end of the decade, we're going to have a lot more technology in this space. Um, you know, how many of you remember when you couldn't send an email between an Apple computer and a PC? We solved that problem, right? But it once was a problem. We are going to solve a lot of these hiccups and pain in the necks about the electronic records. And we're going to figure out how it's better. And I'm sure once the uh, voice to uh, 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 translation, you know, once we get past that crappy Siri and get into something that's real, realistic, <laughs> um, you know, it, probably you'll speak it. And uh, I think things will be a whole lot better in that sphere. And by the way, the advantage of electronic health records is not just that you know, it's interoperable. We're then going to have the ability to actually track people better. We're going to have the ability to make predictions better. We're going to have the ability to figure out which patients are at high risk and intervene before they get sick. It opens up a huge swath of uh, 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 interventions early. And it also reduces fraud. You know, allows you to have better predictive modeling about, you know, who's overbilling you or who's playing games or who's not treating patients despite the fact that you're giving them payment, who's actually not treating them up to snuff. So I think it, it, it's one of those very important foundation zones. Alone is probably not that beneficial. You just put an electronic record in the doc's office. But as part of a growing network of uh, uh, records, data mining, ability to use it to make predictions, uh, use it to figure out which treatments work and don't work. Uh, hugely important foundation stone. Zeke Emanuel, thank you. And thank you for joining us.
Thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.